So we're we are gonna do the, the Python tutorial here. And um, before we start, I um, prepared a small um, small quiz uh, just to uh, just to get familiar uh, a bit with everyone uh, Python level and see if we need to adapt uh, different different things. So you can go to this uh, URL uh, party c party c dot phi uh, and then this number nine four. Six seven six seven four two, and just uh, answer the the questions, uh, and then we'll see the results um, for everyone appearing. Um, so yeah. There should be three different um, different questions. Could you put that URL in the chat? We can't see it. I think. Am I sharing my screen? Uh, okay, that. No. Maybe why? Uh, yes, that should be better. Up. Oh, sorry. This is better. Mm. Okay. So we have ten answers. So we have uh, most people who are um, relatively new to to Python, to Jupyter. Sorry. Uh, when it comes to Python, uh, we have. Uh, it's a bit more more mixed. And finally, when it comes to pandas, it's, uh, yeah, most people are new and some people have some experience to uh, pandas. Okay, great. So uh, we're gonna about go to our uh, VMs uh, that you can open if it's not uh, already open. And we're gonna go in the terminal and go to uh, cd slash vol slash volume slash intro, what is it? Uh, 3b, 3b2, 3b2. Introduction to Python and Pandas. And then you're gonna activate the Conda environment for the day, Conda activate, and the name of the environment, and of the environment is R Python. Once it's activated, you should have this uh, R Python uh, between parentheses prepending uh, your um, your line in the terminal, and then we're going to type Jupyter Notebook and press Enter, and then it's going to launch um, a Jupyter Notebook that will open in uh, the browser, the Firefox browser, um, and. Please uh, 
raise your hands um, if it's not already open for you. And some of you have your webcam off, so I cannot see how you're doing. Okay, I will assume it worked. Um, are you waiting so for the? Can you show the command again? Give an intro to pandas uh, plot nine and click on uh, tutorial that uh, ipynd. Do you know where we can find those commands that you just put in? Okay. So, uh, welcome to the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Jupyter is a, a project that exists since uh, a few years now. And the Jupyter Notebook is the classical interface to Jupyter. Um, if you're more familiar with R, it's similar to um, the R Markdown documents, uh, slightly different though. And um, work. Yes. Perfect. Do you know what the commands were? Uh, uh, so you can interactively uh, uh, interact with your code uh, basically in a in a Jupyter notebook. And um, on the top right, you can see uh, that it's written conda and r python. This is the so-called kernel of the Jupyter notebook. So the language that is running uh, in the background with the packages installed. And if you want, you can also actually have a kernel in R, so you can also do R in, in Jupyter. Um, so first of all, who am I? I'm Maxim Bori. I'm a doctoral researcher in bioinformatics uh, in uh, Christina Warisner's group. And I'm working on ancient DNA microbiome. Uh, this is some of the emoji that um, I uh, use to describe my work. The first one is the Python logo, and the last one is the Nextflow um, Next one, NF Core logos. You can find me, this is my socials on Twitter, uh, GitHub, and my website. So, talking about Python. So, Python is a, a, a scripting language or programming language, interpreted uh, programming language, that has gained a lot of popularity uh, over the recent years for data analysis, thanks to um, its use in the machine learning community. I looked at Wikipedia just before starting the session, and I realized that actually the first table release of Python was made in 1991, which is ex like exactly the year I was born. So Python is going to turn 31 years old um, this year, which means it's a relatively old programming language uh, compared to more newer ones, like Julia, for example. So it comes with uh, historical changes, historical things that, that are harder to change, but overall, it's a very nice general language, and uh, the really nice thing about Python is that it's not only used in bioinformatics. It's used for a lot of different projects. It's for web development, packet development, uh, statistical data analysis, um, general development. A lot of uh, companies use Python. So if you learn Python today and want to switch your career outside of academia, it might be a good argument to put forward um, after your whatever PhD or postdoc. Uh, and today we're going to cover two of the most popular libraries for data analysis in Python, uh, Pandas for reading uh, and manipulating tabular data, which is the ability equivalent of, of dplyr in R, and uh, Plot9, which is the Python clone of ggplot2. It's literally the same syntax. Uh, we're going to just have a brief talk about um, uh, how to work in a Jupyter environment, uh, how to load required libraries in Python, um, quick introduction to pandas, getting data into pandas, dealing with missing data, computing basic summary statistics, filtering data, uh, performing group by operation, joining different tables, and at the end, uh, visual visualizing data with plot9 or ggplot. And uh, also at the end, if we have some time, you will have a small practical uh, to do some, to ask a data-related question on the data set and make a plot and then share it with us uh, to see what, what you could do and what kind of question you could come up with. Uh, so first of all, maybe um, let's, uh, did the pool for, uh, did uh, were any of you concerned by the, the, the pool uh, to retrieve the lost volume? Um, is it is the pool finished? How uh, how is it going for for you? 
And Alex, uh, I think if you go in the in the chat and if you click on nearby, you can have only the comments of the people in the room. And uh, Jaime, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, was asking, can you show the comments again? So Maxime, since I also didn't get what you pasted in because I have no yeah. terminal open, oh. you have to answer it yourself. I'm sorry about that. Uh, can you maybe just share your screen again once with the with the terminal and show quickly the run through how you got there um just that everyone can double check who has still issues um i think that's okay. the best part okay so i can go back to the terminal um open tab let's open a new terminal so you when you open the terminal you should be there and uh, then you type cd cd slash call slash volume slash three b two and you probably saw it already with uh james's and tisa's introduction to to bash or um it has introduction to bash if you tap if you type on the tab uh, key of your keyboard it allows you to go to complete and you press enter and you should be you should have this pass appearing in blue slash vol slash volume slash three b two introduction to Python and pandas. Then you type conda activate activate r Python. And then once it's activated, you should have r Python that is prepending um, the uh, bash invite. And then uh, you type Jupyter not yeah, I'm sorry. I think I, I missed this. The 3B uh, introduction. You missed the 3B2 um, directory. Unload it? Yes, I only added 2D, 2B. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess then the volume needs to pull. Um, okay, uh, otherwise. Um, let me do something for you, uh, up. If you do not have it, uh, I will put a comment in the chat, uh, to get you this repository. So you do git, it add git. You copy paste, copy paste this in the terminal, and it will download the the directory for you. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't do it in another project's um, directory. Otherwise, my uh, colleagues will be mad at me if I uh, if I mess up uh, if I told you to mess up their directory for later. Okay. Is anyone uh, not yet in Jupyter? Can you put a message in the chat if you're not yet in Jupyter? Okay. So, let's go back to Jupyter. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, you're in Jupyter, and uh, Jupyter works with this concept of cells. So everything in Jupyter is, um, is a cell. And actually, what I was showing you just before is, uh, are already cells. It's just that they're uh, markdown cells. So markdown is this um, uh, language to um, similar, a bit similar to HTML, if you're more familiar with HTML. And it has this relatively simple syntax to render uh, texts um, and images and, and a lot of other a uh, lot of other things, code blocks and etc. And so this was a markdown cell, for example. Uh, and you can click on an, uh, on another cell. Uh, the next cell, for example, if you double click on it, you can edit it. Uh, so you can remove and say and make a type, introduce some typos. 
to execute a cell, uh, you can uh, click on select a cell, so it will appear um, uh, in the green box, and then you can click on run, or you can use the keyboard shortcuts uh, to execute a cell, which is control enter. So you double click on a cell to edit it, and then you click on control enter to execute it. So these are some of the features of the Markdown uh, language. Uh, for example, uh, to put the text in bold, you put double star, uh, single star to put in italic. To put inline codes, uh, you surround it by these tactics. Um, you, can have, uh, you can have links, uh, you can have images. This is my profile pictures, and uh, this is the syntax, the syntax sorry, for images. You can even add, have a LaTeX, uh, LaTeX code or LaTeX expressions uh, in Jupyter to put to make some introduce some mathematical equations, for example. Um, so this was just Markdown cells. Uh, you can have some uh, code cells in Python. Uh, so, for example, if I execute it, uh, this is a code cell in Python, and you can notice the counter that is increasing on the right. This is the and the, the count of the execution of all the cells. Uh, you can also have some bash uh, cells. Uh, here, when you prepend the line with an exclamation mark, this will uh, be interpreted as a bash, uh, bash cells. And then you can have uh, multi-line bash cells. And to do so, you do the double percentage sign. You type bash. And then you can have a multi-line uh, bash cell. All right. So as you can see, if you scroll down, um, all of the cells are already executed. Uh, and, but this is not so exciting. And we live in we want to live dangerously today. Uh, so we're going to actually get rid of all the results. And hopefully, we can uh, get them back later. So to do so, uh, you're going to go in cell. Uh, all outputs, and then click on clear. And all our results are gone. What have we done? Um, yes. OK. So um, you can scroll down to loading required libraries, and again, um, you can click on a cell. You will have your cursor that appears blinking in the cell. And to execute the cell, you click on Control Enter. So the first thing here is that we're going to uh, load the required libraries. And the keyword uh, here in Python is import. So we import pandas, uh, the uh, library for manipulating data frames. We import NumPy, which is a library for numerical computation in Python. And then we import plot9, plot9, the clone of ggplot. And here, what you can see I've done is import pandas. And I gave it an alias uh, because programmers are lazy and they don't want to, put, to type pandas every time. So import pandas, and you give it the alias pd. This is the classical alias for pandas in the Python uh, ecosystem. The same goes for NumPy. We import it, we import NumPy, and we give it the alias NP. And the last line, we say that from plot9, we want to import every function. Usually, this is not recommended uh, to import all the functions of, of a package uh, directly with a, with a star, with this uh, wildcard. However, for plot9, it's relatively safe to do so because there are very specific uh, names that won't overlap uh, with other with other packages. So we click on Control Enter. It will take a few seconds to load, and then we can see that uh, we imported our libraries. Uh, we have the five that appear. We can check which version of the package uh, that we are using. Uh, we, usually, uh, packages come with this uh, version underscore, double underscore version uh, attributes. So we can uh, see for, for Pandas, we're using version 1.443. For NumPy, we're using uh, version 1.23.1. 1. 
And for a plot line, you should also have this. However, in the current release of plot line, this is not working completely, but it doesn't matter because we installed everything with Conda. So we can run the bash command to list the version of Conda. And remember, when there is exclamation mark at the beginning of the line, this is a bash command. We execute it, and then uh, we can see when this finished running that we're re using a plot line version 0 0.9.0. All right, so a forward on Pandas. So Pandas, uh, similar to R, um, is using this concept of data frame. So a data frame is basically a table where you have horizontally rows and vertically you have your columns. And each column uh, can be actually seen as a series. So the, where you have the contents, your values actually, and then the index. Uh, of your series, how to access them, um, the, the way that tells you how to has access the elements of your series. So each column is a series, each row is a series if you look at it individually. So a data frame is actually a bunch of series that are made together. And uh, what I would really recommend you, if you want to go further um, later or even um, at any point is to look at the, the introduction to pandas and, and the pandas documentation, which is very thorough and uh, covers a lot more subjects that we're going to cover today and is very, very well made. Uh, there is also a book, uh, if you're interested in it, called Introduction or Python, uh, keyboard shortcut, another thing, Python for Data Science by Jake van der Plaats, uh, I'll accept here. Uh, this one, uh, Py sorry, Python Data Science Handbook. If you want to go deeper, it also covers a lot of the a lot of things with pandas. All right. So, how do we read data with pandas? So for the data that we're going to use today, we're actually going to use the table from the ancient Metagenome Deer project that James presented you yesterday. So the first thing that I've done here is that I went on the GitHub of ancient Metagenome Deer and I looked for the URL, uh, the address of this table, and I just saved it in two different variables. One variable called sample table URL for the sample table and one variable for the library table. So this is not yet pandas, it's just to save them and to avoid uh, typing these super long, uh, super long strings. Oops, my cursor went crazy. Okay, so we uh, control enter to execute it. And then uh, if you look at the documentation, you will see that the function uh, to read tables, the main function to read tables with pandas is the pandas uh, dot read CSV function. However, uh, you might not necessarily know how to use it. Uh, so you can check the help uh, of this function and to check the help of a function in Python, it's really easy. You type help and between parentheses, the name of your function. So it's gonna open the help of this panda.readcsv uh, function. And then you can see that it's taking uh, different parameters. So there are a lot of different parameters we, of course, won't use all of them uh, right now. Uh, but we can see that, for example, what we want is give it a file path. So the file path is actually going to be the URL. You don't even need to download the table. But, um, Pandas is going to download it for us. And we know that um, looking at the table uh, on, on GitHub, that it's a tab-separated uh, table. So we want to give it the sep for separator and uh, arguments and give it the character for uh, tabulations. So this is uh, what we do, we execute it. And then we can uh, already start to look our, at our data. So there are a lot of different ways to look at the table. Um, and uh, the one of the first thing that we can do um, is actually looking at the columns of a table. So uh, we have the dot columns argument or the dot columns attributes actually. 
uh, that tells us which columns are, are in our sample data frame. So we see that we have the column project name, publication year, publication, UI, and etc. cetera. Um, and you might already have been familiar with this if you were loading the table in the uh, interactive interface uh, yesterday. We can also briefly look at the data types. And this is something that uh, at first might seem a bit irrelevant, but it's actually going to be uh, to matter a bit later. And there are different data types when you talk about programming language. Um, and we can already see that we have different data types in our table. So in, in Pandas, uh, you have uh, three main data types. You have the int64, which is for integers, so um, integer numbers, so 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera, positive or negative. You have the float uh, 64, which is for floating point precision uh, number, so all numbers with a comma, uh, with decimals, or real numbers. And then you have the object number, which is a general type in pandas for everything that is not a number, an interval, a category, or a date. So it can be a string, so like text, or it can be more complex object in Python. All right, so now we know which column we have and we know their type. So let's look at the shape of our data frame or the size of our data frame to see how many columns we have and how many rows we have. Um, so the, the, the attribute to use is a dot shape, and we can see that we have 1,060 rows with 16 columns, and if you count the columns manually here, we can see that we also arrive at 16. Great. Uh, maybe now we want to start looking at our data. So um, the functions uh, to do so are actually reusing some of the bash terminology. You probably saw in the bare bone bash um, um, introduction that to look at the beginning of a file, you would use the head commands. Uh, pandas reusing the same uh, the same names for the functions. So you can do sample df.head, and you have the first five lines uh, with the content. You can scroll um, uh, left and right. OK. Um, I don't have a mouse, unfortunately, with me. I only have the trackpad of my laptop. So on this uh, virtual machine, it's not working so well. So I have to click on this. It's a bit annoying. But I guess for some of you who have a mouse, it's a bit better. Can you, can you browse your computer with this mouse? Uh, Once you're in the... I'm not working. Zoom in. Yeah, Oh, this browser. Yes. <laughs> uh, how do you do that? View zoom plus up. OK. Is it better? OK. Um, one uh, important thing to note um, is that unlike R, uh, Python is a zero-based language, meaning that the first element here of an index, but in general, uh, in Python, the first element of everything starts at index uh, zero, like actually the vast majority of programming language. R is a bit of an oddball in, in the programming language world because you start at the index number one. But in most programming language, you start at index zero. And you have to remember that for a bit later because this is going to matter. And otherwise, you're going to have behavior that might seem a bit strange. Uh, so we look at the first five rows. We can also look at the last five rows um, with the tail function. And then it's always, what I always like to do is to uh, randomly look at uh, a given number of rows because sometimes uh, you have uh, data that vary quite a bit within a table. And by selecting them randomly, you might see some issues that might not appear at the beginning or at the end of a table. OK, so we can see that uh, everything seems all right. We don't have too many uh, missing data. The data seem to make sense. Uh, we don't have problems 
with columns uh, being misread seems all right. Okay. So, is everyone still on board? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, because before we continue, maybe just a quick hint, because uh, David uh, had a problem with his um, cloning your the repository. Actually, the command is not git pull, but git clone if you oh, have yes, not downloaded it. So, uh, David, yours should be fine. You can reconnect, and I will put the command in the chat for everyone else if they have issues still. Yeah, sorry. Git pull is when you already have the repository. Okay. And uh, for Davide, but also um, as a general thing for um, everyone else, uh, you also can right click on a cell in, um, no, click on a cell, sorry, in Jupyter, and uh, click on cell, run, and run all above, so it's going to run all the cells uh, above this, the current one, and so you can catch up um, to where we are at the moment. All right. So now we saw uh, how... Get the mouse. I'm the mouse. Oh, you do have a mouse. Ah, oh, one. Oh, no. I'm going to connect a mouse. The trackpad is a bit annoying on these uh, uh, virtual servers. Keyboard assistant setup. OK. Uh, so we saw how to look at the first, the last, and uh, randomly look at five rows, but maybe you want to look at specific um, rows. So here we saw that um, actually the index on the very first, on the very left of our data frame is uh, numbers. And to access um, the index, uh, to access a specific row, we can use the integer um, integer location or the integer indexing uh, of the data frame. And in Pandas, this is the keyword iLock for integer uh, location. So we select the 10th row. Remember that uh, we start counting at 0. So if you want the 10th row, it's uh, the, the actually index number 9. Uh, we can click on Control, uh, press Control Enter. And we see that we get actually a series uh, for this 10th row. Uh, with the value of all the different columns. So we have the column names and the values, actually. Uh, we can select uh, um, a slice of different rows, so from the rows 10 to the row uh, 12, uh, oh, sorry, uh, 9 to 11. Um, yeah. Uh, so the 10 to the 12th row, because we start at index 0. Uh, we can also uh, select only uh, a slice of the columns, so still the same rows, but a slice of the columns to only specific uh, to get specific columns. We can also directly access a single column, so getting all the rows for a single column. Um, there are different ways to do it, but you can put it either between brackets, so we have all all the values uh, for the site name uh, for all of our rows with our, our 1,060 rows. Uh, when, when the columns uh, have a name that uh, doesn't have spaces or doesn't have funky characters, you can also access them directly with the dots notation. Um, so for example, site name, uh, you can access it like this. Uh, you can also remove a row. Uh, so, for example, removing the first row uh, with the drop uh, function. Uh, and what is important to note is that um, by default, you're always operating on a copy of your data frame. So here, 
I uh, dropped the first one, the copy of my data frame, but actually my original data frame still has uh, the original row. Uh, and then you can also remove a project and, oh, sorry, a column. And here to remove the column project name, you have to specify that you're working on columns uh, when you're using the drop function. And to do so, you specify the axis. So the axis is zero, which is the default uh, for rows. That's why we didn't have to specify it above. And for column, the axis is one. Um, so we specify it, and then we can drop, uh, can remove the column project name. Okay. So uh, we saw the basic overview of reading and looking at the data. Now we kind of uh, enter uh, the world of real data. So when you work with real data, like the table that we have here, you will often encounter missing data, which can uh, be a problem that you might have to deal with. So the missing data, uh, whether it's in Python or R, are often represented with this NA or NAN, not available data. And there is this function in Pandas called isNA. So it's basically going to look at every single value and check if it's NA. So you could look through the data frame and try to see if you see some true. Uh, but this is not really, we're not machines and we are using a machine, so we're going to have to be a bit smarter than this uh, because we are very lazy. Also note that here um, we're only seeing the first five rows and the last five rows and the, all of the other was masked because otherwise it would be just too, too big of a table to show. You can change this behavior, but usually it's nice to leave it as a default. Otherwise, your um, Jupyter notebook might become a bit messy. So now we're going to start to be a bit more clever. So we're going to actually chain functions, a bit similar if you're familiar um, with tidyverse to the pipe, except that here in, um, in Python, it's native to Python. You can very easily chain uh, different functions. And so we had this bit already before, and now we're going to say, I want to compute the sum on the columns. Uh, so we can see that uh, we have the sum, and the sum of um, true or false uh, uh, values is equal to one if it's true and zero if it's uh, if it's false. Um, and uh, we see that we have a lot of zeros, so meaning that uh, we have, uh, for most uh, items, we actually don't have missing values, uh, but we still see that we don't see a lot. Uh, we only see the first five and the last five. So we're going to sort them, and we're going to sort them by a decreasing order. And we see that actually we have quite a few uh, items uh, where we have missing values. So for example, uh, we can look at the row number 800 or of uh, index 800 and see what values are missing. And for example, we can see that the publication uh, by James uh, where uh, the specific sample is missing the latitude and the longitude. So what should we do? Um, well, the ideal scenario would be to correct or maybe even impute the data. Sometimes you can kind of try to guess the data by different methods. Um, however, it might not be always possible. Uh, and when you really can't correct it uh, or can't impute it, then usually you have to get rid of it. Uh, fortunately for us here, I went a bit in the past of ancient metagenome deer. And this missing data, I think, have now been corrected, um, or should have been corrected. Um, so if you look at the current version of this table, um, you shouldn't have this missing data anymore. But otherwise, sometimes you don't have, uh, if you're really interested in it, unfortunately, there is not much that you can do. All right. So 
Now we want to compute some basic statistics. Uh, so the, the, the very handy function in Pandas uh, to compute basic statistics is the describe function. If you're familiar with R, um, it's the similar to the summarize, um, the summarize uh, function. So uh, describe is only going to run for some columns. And this is where we have to remind ourselves of the data types. So describe is actually only going to run for some data types. Here, only the integer and the floating precision uh, number. So it's given, going to give us the count. Uh, and if data are missing, uh, we're going to see it here. So for example, for all the samples, uh, we have uh, the publication year available. But for the lati latitude and longitude, we apparently have um, 39 that are missing. For all the samples, we also have a sample age. It can give us the mean. So the mean publication year is uh, 2019. How relevant is it to know this? I don't know. Uh, tells us that the field is relatively young, maybe. Uh, you can have the standard deviation, the minimum, the 25% percentile, 50% percentile, 75% percentile, and maximum. And you have it for all uh, the numerical columns. So integer or floating point precision uh, number. All right. So this is for all the columns that have uh, integer or floating point precision type. We can also um, uh, compute specific metrics. So if we're only interested in the mean, um, we can look at the mean with the mean function. So again, we see exactly uh, the same uh, results. Uh, we can compute uh, all of the summary statistics for specific columns. So again, accessing the columns as we've done it before, uh, either with the bracket notation like this, or we can also um, uh, access it with the dot notation, so sample dot publication underscore year dot describe. And sample uh, underscore data frame dot describe, we have exactly the same thing. All right, so we can also compute a uh, single uh, summary statistic for the mean, the median, the minimum, uh, the maximum, the number of unique values, for example, for the site name. So how many sites, we know what, that we have 1,060 samples, but how many unique sites are they coming from? So these 1,060 samples are coming from 246 sites. The functions for that is n unique. Uh, we can also um, look at um, how many uh, hosts um, or where these um, the samples are coming from. And for this, we're basically going to look at the sample host uh, column. So we can have a uh, we can have have a preview at what's in the sample host column. Sample host. And see that in the sample host we have the name of the, the organism, so Homo sapiens, Pantroglorites, uh, Neanderthal, etc. And if we're in these value codes, it's going to count the name, the number of times each of these values appear. So we see that most of the samples are actually uh, associated with humans. We have a bunch of uh, bear sample. I'm not sure what Ambrosia um, is. We have a bunch of plant samples, Neanderthal sample. I think this is chimpanzee, gorilla, etc. OK. Then we can look at the quantile, uh, for example, of the publication years uh, to see when most of the, of the samples were published. Uh, so we can see that uh, starting in 2014, 
and then uh, actually most of the samples were published in the most of the the samples in this table were published in the more recent years from 2020 onwards and finally we can do a quick uh, uh, plot of uh, for example the publication years with the built-in pandas uh, plotting function I wouldn't recommend it for uh, preparing plot for publications, but when you do data analysis, you can have this quick plotting function to just investigate uh, your data directly within Pandas without any preparing anything. And this tells us basically the same as the quantile, but in a more visual way, uh, seeing that most of the data are uh, published in the year 2020 and 2021. All right. How is everyone doing so far? Can you follow up? Any questions? Okay. If you don't have questions um, and if you don't manifest yourself, I will assume that you're understood. So be careful, there will be questions at the end. All right, let's go back to it. Um, and as always, if you're lost, you can um, you can always uh, uh, during the tutorial uh, click on cell uh, run all. It will execute the whole notebook. Um, and in, after the tutorial, you can always uh, go back uh, to the uh, intro to um, Pandas tutorial on their website, and they go uh, a bit slower and also a bit more in depth uh, and explain you in more details what's happening actually in the background. So it's not because you're um, you lost the track at some point that you're lost forever with Pandas. They have a really great documentation. Okay, so now we come to filtering the data set and it's maybe the more interesting part um, of the tutorial because usually you won't, uh, uh, you will compute the summary statistics but you will not access uh, in most of the cases um, the, the data by their index. It's a, a less common uh, use case, let's say. Usually you're more interested, for example, in looking at uh, which data are coming from uh, Homo sapiens, for example. Um, so there are different ways of, of filtering data in pandas. The first uh, way is the uh, classic method with uh, bracket indexing. So actually, uh, in this method, uh, we first uh, ask um, for example, the column um, for the column sample DF, for, sorry, for the column publication year, um, we ask uh, which of these is inferior to 2015, strictly inferior to 2015. And we're going to get this series which with a lot of true and false, a bit similar to what we had when we had uh, the is and a. And once we have this, uh, we're going to use the indexing um, here uh, to only give us uh, the true value, the, the, the rows where uh, this, in the, this series is true, with the value of this series is true. And this is going to give us all the publication before 2015. And we can see that actually we don't have so many publications uh, uh, before 2015. Uh, so we can count them manually or remember that we are always lazy so we can say dot shape. Dot shape. And we can see that we have 11 publications uh, before 2015. So 11 samples, actually not 11 publications before 2015. And they're coming from apparently uh, two di three different publications. One from uh, Christina Warner, one from Campana, and one from Apples. Uh, this is a very simple filtering scenario, but maybe we want to do a more complicated filtering scenario. 
So get all the publications before 2015 and only in the northern hemisphere. By the way, uh, these uh, lines where they're prepending with the hash symbol, the pound symbol, is for a comment in Python. So you can write whatever you want. This is not going to be interpreted by Python. It's just for uh, the user or the developer to remember or to explain what they're doing here. So we do this, and then here noticed that um, I had to put it uh, to put each condition. So for the one before 2015, I had to put it between parentheses. I had uh, this um, this sign, this uh, end sign. Uh, how do you call this in English, actually? Mm -hmm. This sign. The ampersand. The ampersand, yeah. Esperluette in French. If you're interested <laughs> in learning French the ampersand sign in the middle, and then the other condition that is also between uh, parentheses, and we're interested only in the northern hemisphere, uh, so we want a longitude greater than zero. Uh, so this works, but this already gets a bit ugly, and if you add more conditions, it can rapidly become very cumbersome. So that's why in Pandas, you actually have another method uh, to uh, filter your data, which is the query method. And this is uh, my, my method of choice for filtering data. So it's, uh, you choose your data frame, you, you, you use the data frame, use the query function, and then you put the name of the column and your condition. So here, the name of the column, and notice that this has to go uh, between uh, quotation marks, simple or double, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then it produces the same results. And if you want to have um, more than one condition, you just uh, uh, tie them with the N keyword. You can also have the OR keyword, of course. So here, same uh, publication before 2015 and in the Northern Hemisphere. And we have uh, uh, three samples from two different uh, publications. All right. So this is the very basic of filtering, uh, filtering a table and the values of uh, the rows. And I would recommend you to use the query method because uh, the more complicated the condition gets, the easier it is to uh, write it with query instead of the indexing, with the bracket indexing uh, method. But both are valid. And I also, it's a lot of things are a matter, a matter of personal preference, but I also find it a bit more elegant and easier to read than with the bracket indexing. I may might make a comment there. Like there are certain conditions that are not you are not able to put in the query, um, like in the query notation. Um, like for example, if you have nested conditions, so you should get yourself familiar at least if you want to really consider using. Um, uh, pandas for analysis like this with uh, both methods um, because, like I said, for some of them you are very likely thrown back to use the log function um, instead. Yeah, that's true. There are some very complex conditions where you have to use the both, but actually query is, is very, very flexible and I'm rarely finding the limitation of uh, query. All right. Um, so now we saw to filter um, data. Uh, sometimes we want to, um, we need to apply a so-called group by operation. So a group by operation uh, is represented uh, here by this uh, little schematic. So we start with our sample data frame and we're gonna say group by, uh, for example, the sample host column. So what it's gonna do in the background, you're not gonna see it, but in the background is the equivalent of separating data frame um, by the value of sample host. So it's gonna create, for example, one data frame where it contains only the homo sapiens um, sample host, one data frame where it only contains the uh, bare sample host. Um, but this you're not gonna see, it's happening in the background. Then we're gonna select a column uh, that we're interested in. So for example, in this data frame, we want only the column sample age. 
and we're going to use an aggregate, aggregation function. So for each of these data frame, compute this aggregation for, um, function, for example, here, get the minimum. So we split the data frame by sample host, and we're looking for the minimum of sample age by uh, sample host. So this is what happens if you run it. So we can see that, for example, uh, the minimum sample age or the oldest uh, sample for the different hosts is uh, the following. And so the oldest uh, actually sample is coming from a mammoth uh, here in this data set. So this is very nice. Uh, we also see that the second one is Neanderthal, uh, makes sense. And we can see that the, the, uh, the oldest uh, Homo sapiens is uh, 100. And I don't remember what is the, you would have to look in the ancient metagenome deer, um, um, the ancient metagenome deer to see uh, what, how this age is represented. I don't remember exactly. Um, also, before, we used the value counts uh, function. And actually, a value counts is actually implementing a group by uh, function just before. So we're counting the value of the sample host to see how many samples from each, sam from each host we had. And we, you can do actually exactly the same with group by. And actually, it's running group by in the background. So this is, uh, we group by sample host. We get the sample host column, and then we count and this is what we get, exactly the same as a value counts uh, function. So group by are very interesting if you want to uh, compare compute statistics uh, on different, uh, separately for different groups. All right. Um, as always, um, since we're gonna start a new section, am I still with everyone? Any question on filtering, on querying? Are you amazed that uh, the oldest sample is actually so old? No. I have two questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, first is you said that uh, the one, the data frame that we are manipulating is a different one compared to the one that we imported. So where can I see where the imported one is and where can I see where the data frame that we are working on is? So the one that is displayed is always the result, uh, but the original one, um, the original one, you can always um, um, create a new cell. So you do cell, uh, or it's insert cell above, and then you can type sample uh, df, and then you have the original table. Uh, to save a table into a new variable, it's um, actually very easy. So if you want to say, for example, this series in a new variable, you can say uh, uh, df group by post, and you say equal. Now you can look at uh, what's in this DF group by host variable here. Okay. Uh, there is also for some of the pandas function, there is also the keyword in place, uh, meaning that you directly save the results in the data frame. Um, you can use it, but yeah, you have to remember that it's then modifying your original data frame. So you have to remember that, that you used it. All right. So we're going to talk about reshaping data from uh, wide format to long format and back. And you may also have heard of the tidy data format. So the concept of uh, the long format or the tidy data format is to have uh, one column corresponding to one, one type of data or one kind of data. So for example, what you, a good example um, uh, is often like, for example, you would have the name of an individual and then you would have the year. So if you track an individual, uh, it's the example that we're going to see just below, 
would have the individual and the year uh, from his birth and tracking his height. Uh, however, what we're really tracking is the height. So instead of having 1991, 1992, etc., we could have a column called height and then put the value, uh, put the value uh, directly here. So uh, that's what we're going to see. So actually, in the, the table that we're working with is already pretty much in a tidy uh, format, meaning that each column corresponds to one kind of data. So we can't really do, it wouldn't really make sense to reshape the, 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 the data frame of ancient metagenome here. It's already relatively tidy. So I created this, um, this fictional data frame um, tracking the height of two individuals, John and Jack, uh, at, uh, in four different years. So this is the, in, the, in the wide data format. The years are the columns, and the height is here. Uh, and how would we reshape it from wide to uh, long or tidy? Uh, there are different ways to do it in pandas, and the one I would recommend is the melt uh, function. So you can actually visualize, visualize, think about it. it. You can imagine your data frame is made out of wax. You apply a bit of, of heat, you melt it, and it's uh, melting in a long data frame. It's falling down. And for the melt uh, function, we have to specify different things. We have to specify the ID variable. So here, we want to keep track of the identity uh, variable, uh, and so we actually give the name of the column. So this is the individual. And all of the other columns are going to be uh, the, um, the variable that we want to melt. And then in the new table, we want to give it a name, and we want to give a name to the value, and it will make sense when I execute this comment. So we have the individual, we kept it, and now for each individual, um, we have the column birth year and the column height. Actually, it shouldn't be birth year, it should probably be year. All right. So we got from wide format to long format. Um, yeah. You also have the case that you might encounter as kind of a bonus scenario, but you might encounter it. Um, when you have, uh, for example, uh, the, the, in the column name, uh, you have the type, they, they're basically specifying what kind of data is it. Usually for your, it's kind of obvious, but I don't know, you could be tracking uh, the number of cells in different uh, populations, and then this wouldn't be so, so obvious. You could have... Uh, Population, uh, population A, population B, population C. And there is this uh, built-in um, uh, function in pandas called wide to long, which applies specifically to this case when you want to uh, reshape it and also handle uh, this, um, this kind of uh, string that is prepending the value of the column. And this is how it works. It's kind of bonus, but sometimes uh, it might be uh, useful, and we can see that we get the similar results. Um, once we have a tidy data frame, sometimes we want to go back to the wide format. And uh, the function to do that is the function pivot, uh, or in other languages, also in Excel, for example, it's called pivot table. And usually when uh, you talk with people who are doing Excel, they seem very fancy when they say, I'm doing a pivot table today. Um, but actually, it's, it's just one word in Pandas. And we can execute it. And here, we can see that there is an error because I renamed the column uh, birth year into year. So I can just change it here. Okay. And we're back to the original data frame. And we can see that you have some uh, warnings. Warnings in Python are not errors. They are warning, and it just tells you that something might change in the future. Usually, you, you, 
kind of read at them, but most of the time you can ignore them, except if they're, they look specifically bad. But here it tells us in a future version, uh, blah, 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 blah. So for now, we don't really care. Okay. So um, reshaping the data from white to long is especially interesting when we are working with uh, ggplot or the Python uh, clone called plot9 because it's working exclusively uh, with uh, tidy or long format data. And also it's very, it's very nice also sometimes to, for querying, uh, using the query methods, it's sometimes easier to work with uh, long or tidy data formats. All right. Uh, any other question? Okay. So now that we've reshaped uh, tables, um, we're going to look at how to join uh, different tables, join or merge them. Uh, if any of you have, um, have done a work with uh, SQL or SQL, you might be familiar with the, the join keyword, the inner join, outer join, natural join, whatever join. Uh, this is the same concept uh, in Pandas. Um, to, we have to, to join two different tables. We have to have a column uh, in common between the two different tables, which are, we are going to call the T. And, um, for all the rows that have a matching value, um, we're going to be able to put these two tables uh, together. So for example, in these two tables, th this is the key. And thanks to the key, uh, we're going to have our new data frame. So uh, in the case of ancient metagenome deer, uh, we actually have um, uh, a lot of columns that uh, could be used as key. But the one that we're going to use is the column uh, sample name. And the keyword to um, join two tables in pandas is actually uh, not join, but merge. And we're going to merge um, the sample DF, uh, sample data frame uh, with the library data frame. And they both have the, they both share the column sample name, so we can say that we want to merge them on the column sample name, use the column sample name as the key. And here, uh, I'm just going to show the columns that we have uh, to show um, one issue that uh, we're going to have doing that. So I was saying that um, sample, the sample data frame and the library data frames uh, share actually more than one column in common. So we could join them or more than one column. And this is why we have this underscore X and underscore uh, Y that will appear. For example, we have project name X and project name Y. This means that the two data frames are a uh, column in common. And what Pandas is doing to try to disambiguate them is adding your X for the left data frame, so the first one, the sample data frame, and the Y uh, for the library data frame. Uh, usually, this shouldn't happen if the table are uh, correctly formatted. You shouldn't have columns uh, uh, in common. Uh, and But here, we have some, some in comments. Uh, so what we can do is actually uh, drop the comments, get rid of the extra columns that we don't need before merging. So we're going to get rid of them uh, in the library uh, data frame. And here I put everything uh, in one uh, single line. But you don't need to, you can do it separately if you want by creating intermediary objects. So here uh, I have this, the library data frame where I dropped, um, I dropped the columns that are duplicated and I still merge it on the sample name uh, column execute it, and we can see now, if we look at the columns, come on, uh, 
and that we don't have the we don't have the X and Y columns anymore. We don't have this duplicated column situation anymore. Um, maybe a nice thing to note, an in, in, interesting thing to note about um, about uh, Jupyter, about Python in general. So you can see here my line is too long to fit in my screen. So when you work with um, with uh, Python, uh, because it's a language that uh, that cares about how your code is indented, uh, you cannot do directly multi-line uh, comments. To do multi-line comments, um, you have to put uh, the command between parentheses. So, if, for example, I could put a parenthesis at the beginning of, beginning of the line, and and one at the end of the line, of course the keyboard shortcut is not working. Up. And then I can uh, I can basically uh, put return uh, return characters uh, to make it uh, more readable. I can say dot merge. I can even make another indentation here, library f dot drop. Access one, one sample name. Uh, you can indent it the way you want uh, when it's between uh, parentheses. Now I can see everything in one screen. Okay. So we have our two um, our two tables that we put together, and they are contained in the merge data frame uh, variable. And this also answer go back to your question, um, I think Jaime was the one asking the question on uh, how to save the results in a data frame. You can't do like in R, where uh, at the end of the line you put uh, uh, the caret uh, character, this doesn't work, you have to save it at the beginning of a line, or you have to do in place for some of the functions. All right, now we come to the more visual part, visualizing the results uh, with plot nine. So we're gonna work on this merge uh, data frame. So again, if I lost you somewhere um, uh, somewhere in the middle, you can now click on this cell and then click on a cell and run all above. And then you're gonna have the merge data frame that is ready uh, to use for the plotting part because we need it. So if some of you are already familiar um, with uh, ggplot, uh, in R, uh, plot9 is uh, exactly the same syntax. And actually, the library is called plot9, but the function is called ggplot. It's literally, it's exactly the same. The only thing that changes is that in Python, uh, you need to put the name of the variable uh, between uh, things single or double quotation mark. This is literally the only thing that changes in the syntax. So if you know ggplot from R, you can use plotline directly. There is no learning curve and this is very, very nice. So here, um, maybe let's build it uh, incrementally. So for those of you who are not familiar with ggplot, um, you first have uh, to create, uh, you first have to create um, the ggplot. Uh, and it's going to give you a blank canvas because you just created a ggplot, but you didn't ask a ggplot to plot anything. So we told ggplot that on the x-axis we want our publication year, but we didn't ask ggplot to make any kind of plot. And to add actually a plot to ggplot, you use the plus sign, and here we want an histogram. So let's just do the histogram. And again, I'm using the keyboard shortcut to introduce a cell, but otherwise you say insert cell above, or you press on A. Uh, let's not put it here, let's put it here. Up. And we have our histogram that appears. And it's actually exactly the same histogram that we saw before um, from the built-in plotting function of pandas, but here we make it with ggplot. And we have a warning here that says um, pick better value. 
I'm going to ignore it. And then it's kind of personal preferences. Um, but I usually, I'm not usually a big fan of this gray background that comes by default with ggplot. Uh, so there are a lot of different themes that are available in ggplot or plot9. And my favorite one is the classic uh, theme where you have a white uh, background. So now we have uh, the publication here. For each publication year, we have the name of the number, sorry, of samples uh, that were published by year. You can see the year 2021 was very, very productive. Um, yes. So um, we can also start to ask some questions. Uh, for example, uh, is the sequencing depth increasing with the years? So we see that we have more samples, um, uh, more samples in the more recent years. This could be due to the rising popularity of the field, or maybe we could think it's because it's getting cheaper uh, to sequence, so people can afford more samples for the same money. Or we, they could sequence the same amount of sample, but just sequence them each of the sample deeper, um, and then get. A more um, a more broad overview of the sample. So here, um, to um, to tr it's not uh, entirely necessary, but I wanted to point it out. Sometimes uh, you can transform uh, the type of your data to the categor categorical data type, and this is nice because then categories can be uh, reordered uh, in the way that you want. So here I'm just showing it. You don't really need to do it in this case. Uh, but it's very nice sometimes when you don't have uh, integer data, if you want to reorder the categories, for example, you have to display uh, the human data first and then the, um, the chimpanzee data second. You can transform them to categories and choose the order of the category. And now we can see uh, also uh, that the types to see that the uh, the types got up. now uh, the publication here is now a category called data type. Okay, so now uh, we have this plot, and again, this one is a bit more uh, complicated. Uh, it's a bit more bit more layers to this plot. And it's the very nice thing about JGplot is that you can layer uh, and add different layers on top of the basic canvas. So here again, you can see uh, that the line is actually overflowing um, in the Jupyter notebook. Uh, another way in Python to uh, have everything fit in your screen is to use this backslash. So you can type backslash. Uh, and it's uh, going to break the line and uh, make sure that Python still reads it as a single line um, and not as uh, multiple different lines. This backslash, and now we can see the different uh, elements. So we can see that I have my basic canvas. I say use the, uh, for the x-axis, use the publication year. For the y-axis, use the read count. But here I uh, use NumPy, this uh, numerical Python libraries and the log tend the uh, logarithm of base tend to transform the read count so that it's more on a more interpretable scale. And I can do this directly uh, within uh, plot nine. And for the filling color, the fill arguments, I use the publication here uh, as well. I use uh, the jitter. So the jitter is this uh, little points uh, that you see in the background. And uh, for ggplot, um, you first uh, put this layer, then you add the second layer on top, and then uh, all the layers that you're going to add subsequently are going to be uh, on top of each other. So for example, I could add a violin plot. Oh, yeah, I'm more familiar with the violin. And it's going to appear. Oh, and I forgot the backslash. And it's going to appear on the top of it. All right, I'm going to get rid of the violin because it's, we already have the jitter. So you can layer a lot of different things, and that's the, very, the, the power of ggplot is that you can, it allows you to customize your plots uh, in a very nice way. And the alpha parameter here is for the transparency. So 
um, I put some transparency in the jitter to not give it too much importance to the eye and uh, also in the box plot so that we can still see a bit in the background the jittering. All right. So now let's combine some of the concepts uh, that we saw uh, and then use, uh, for example, the group by. So let's do, uh, let's group the samples by publication year and then look at the read count and compute the mean. So let's first have a look at what this is doing. And this is going to give us for the publication year uh, the mean of the read count. However, this is a series and uh, plot nine works with data frames. So there is this function in pandas called two frame to transform a series to a data frame. So we add two frame. And uh, the other thing that uh, plot nine um, has to work, it doesn't work with the index. So we want to reset the index to put the index as a regular column. And this is inherited from the, the, the choices originally made by ggplot, that ggplot doesn't work directly with the index. Because in the tidy concept, you don't have a, the index, is just the number, the number of the row. It shouldn't contain actually values of uh, your data. So we reset the index, and now the column, the index that was the publication year, is now a normal column. So this is what we did here, and we saved it uh, in the variable average read count by year. And now we can actually do the JGPlot. plot. So again, to break the line, we can put this backslash. And this the same plot. And here I can also add the classic theme uh, if I want. I think there is also a XKCD team, XKCD. Uh, I forgot the plus. Uh, to give you this XKCD comics uh, kind of plot. I wouldn't recommend you, recommend you to use it for a paper, but uh, for the laws, why not? All right. Uh, so now it's going to be your turn, actually. Um, I suggested a, a question uh, for you to try uh, to investigate the relation between uh, the type of library treatments, uh, so whether it's uh, UDG treated, UDG half treated, or not at all, uh, and the relation with the publication years to see if some methods were more popular on some years, for example, or to see uh, when the first UDG treated library started to appear, or if the method is kind of fading away and people say, no, at the end, we don't really care. So you can do this with the data that we have. And it's um, actually uh, 12, and I think the session ends at 12.30 or 12.15. The next session? No, when does one, does one hand? This is uh, sorry, half an hour. Half an hour, okay. So we have, we have actually a lot of time, so maybe uh, I give you until 12.15 uh, to kind of uh, try to play with the, um, with the data and make a plot. And then we have 15 minutes uh, at the end uh, for you to share uh, what you've done, explain us uh, if you want your, uh, your reasoning and sh share the plot also. And uh, yeah, and then we can share them on the, on the Slack and uh, spam the channel with uh, the beautiful plots about ancient metagenome DNA.